Welcome to the Stonebridge Podcast. This is the uh, one and only official podcast of Stonebridge Press, where we talk about Japan, we talk about books about Japan, we talk about writing about Japan, and I'm Peter Goodman. I'm publisher of Stonebridge Press. I'm in Berkeley, California, and today I am talking with Patrick Macias, and you should all know who Patrick is. Hi, Patrick. Hi there. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know who Patrick is, Patrick is an American author. He grew up in... Sacramento, California. He now lives in Tokyo, Japan. He's the author and co-author of several books on pop culture fandom, specifically relating to Japanese culture and otaku culture in America. And you are the editor-in-chief of Otaku USA magazine. How many years have you been doing that? Geez, I think it's uh, we're on our 17th year right now. It's a little frightening. Wow for wow. a print magazine. Maybe there's some kind of curse or some sort of supernatural power at work that's keeping this magazine alive. I'm not sure, but yeah, 17 years. Well, fantastic. Congratulations. I mean, any magazine in the last 17 years must be doing something right. So, and uh, Patrick has lived in uh, Tokyo for the last uh, six years, although um, I was telling him before we started recording that uh, I met up with him in 2007. So uh, Patrick's connections to Japan go you know, way more than six years ago. His most recent book is called Mondo Tokyo, Dispatches from a Secret Japan, which is described as a collection of past writing plus some new pieces. And it was published uh, this year, right, Patrick? Yes, earlier this year by Sutherland House in North America. As if that's not enough, Patrick also has a regular podcast called Pure Tokyo Scope, which he does with a fellow author, Matt Alt. And it is a really fun listen, very entertaining. Together, Patrick and Matt, they make a, uh, what would you call it, a delicious salad. (laughs) <laughs> they alternate the roles of greens and dressings, so it's a pretty tasty thing to listen to, and I highly recommend it. And while we're talking about books, I, I should say he is also the co-author of Cruising the Anime City, an otaku guide to Neo-Tokyo from, of all places, Stonebridge Press. Oh, yeah. Patrick is, he's, he's one of the, uh, the old guard. I don't think I'm quite old guard yet. I have to be like in the Fred shot or the Fred patent level. And I'm, I think I'm maybe second generation to yeah, those guys. Okay. They were, they were kind of my, my, I don't want to say idols, but they were my, they were my North stars. I think yeah. so they kind of, they kind of blazed the trail. We, we published cruising the, the anime city. Uh, I was looking at it. It was like oh, exactly 20 years ago. Oh my gosh, was it that long? I thought it was like 2007-ish, but man, I guess it was earlier. It's funny because I actually ran into Tomo fairly recently here in Tokyo, and he said, you know, we did that book too early. He said, like, that book was way ahead of its time because anime tourism wasn't really a thing. And here we were doing this travel guide to Tokyo with these like maps showing you where all the stores were and stuff like that. And uh, it took another... 10, uh, 15 years for that. I mean, now you see tourists here. I see them in Shibuya, Shinjuku. They're coming just for the pop culture. They may not even do anything traditional Japanese culture related. They're just here to shop at the Pokemon store. And, you know, God bless them for keeping the economy here strong. But um, that book was ahead of its time, is I guess what I'm trying to say. It's it's, it's true. And, uh, you know, my, my inclination to publish a book like that, I, I, I mean... It just shows how prescient and what a bad businessman I am, you know, because... Well, the right people found it, you know, then the right people found the right stores and they bought the uh, the right things that make them happy. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in a way we have bragging rights. I, I will say that, you know, Fred Schott, you, you mentioned Fred. Uh, I was Fred's editor for Manga Manga. Well, there you go. And that was back in 1983, I think. So, I mean, even even longer ago. And um, at the time, I, I, I think I've told this story before to other people, um, Kodasha was ashamed of, of its manga, the fact that people would sit in subways and read these thick comic books. They didn't want anyone to know, so they really resisted publishing wow. uh, any book about manga. Yeah, I mean, I kind of miss manga's status as like junk culture. You know, it's not yeah, quite yeah, high culture, yeah. but the minute you get off the airplane here at like Haneda or Narita, it's like, welcome to Japan. Here's Super Mario. Here's Doraemon. Here's <laughs> Dragon Ball. You know, like there, it's it's so mainstream. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it's cooler when it's underground, but I, 
you know, irresponsible pictures, you know, manga. It's it's baked into the name. It's baked into this the description. But I think like some of the newer shows, like my daughter, she's 12 years old now, and through no fault of my own, yeah, she watches anime. She's not like a full grown crazy otaku, but she watches like Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba. And uh, she's been watching it, you know, since she was like nine years old. And I'm astonished at how violent and bloody and like one minute there'll be a beheading, you know, like as gory as anything we watched in the 90s in Ninja Scroll. And then the next minute there's like a wacky joke. One of the characters ate a pepper that's too spicy. Oh, no. Well, I mean, that was the whole, that was the whole thing. It was the mixing of tones that, uh, you know, particularly foreign audiences couldn't possibly figure it out. It's yeah. like, this is a... Is this a kid's book or what? Wait a second. Somebody's like having their head cut off. What, what is going on? <laughs> or, I, I remember that. I mean, that was definitely one of the problems that the Japanese had was, what are they going to think of us when they see this? They're going to think we're all nuts. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I mean, that was a problem, right? It's, it's still a bit of a problem. I, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about that with you. I mean, manga has definitely become international. I mean, to the point where you have – sort of American manga drawn a Japanese style. You can probably tell the difference. I probably can't because I'm not really an aficionado. But I I mean are there are there differences, do you think, between the manga that are being produced in Japan, maybe for domestic Japanese con- consumption, and then the manga that are being produced not by Japanese outside Japan, but kind of looks sort of like manga. I mean, I have worked at major, you know, anime streaming sites. I've worked at, you know, anime manga publishers. And um, there, there's several tracks here. One track is just localizing good stuff from Japan, or hopefully, or interesting stuff if there's pressure from the Japanese publisher to publish, you know, a title that's maybe, they know it's not going to sell, but it's like a prestige thing, or it's like, you know, some editor promised some CEO that they'd make this. That's, you know, almost like an ego trip. And then there's there's some things they are calculated to be hits, and they're not always hits. You can't make things hits. I mean, I remember after the Pokemon boom, I guess that was what, like in the early 2000s, that first wave of Poke Madness that struck the world. All of these Japanese companies were trying to create the next big Pokemon, like a toy that was also an anime or a manga. And, uh, you know, they were all primed to be huge hits, huge amounts of money spent, and, you know, a lot of them didn't go anywhere. There's also this kind of more insidious thing that I see happening now, which is American companies using anime as a means to kind of keep their IP alive. This is how we get things like Terminator anime, or we get like Lord of the Rings anime. We get, um, and there's those things kind of take up a lot of space in a studio's production schedule. When you, when you say that there is, say, Lord of the Rings anime, you mean it's cartoon done in the anime style? Is that- no, like a f- like the the Western IP holder will contract a Japanese studio. Oh, I see. Japanese okay. artist. Jap- there is a Lord of the Rings anime film coming out later this year, I guess, theatrically around the world. Uh, there's a Terminator anime that I think just started streaming last week, and there's you know, like a Batman ninja. You know, there's all these things, and um, that's not really what I signed up for for my in my Japanese pop culture. You know, I, I don't think there's that many stories you can tell um, set like in the alien universe, let alone using anime. Yeah, I, I wonder what I, I wonder what that. I mean, is it actually adding to the adding to the content? How is it's it? a way to keep the IP alive, just the content just, stream flowing. It's also very cheap to make. You know, you can make an anime for you know three or four million dollars US. Whereas if you're going to make a movie, you're looking at like what like. 80 to 100 million just as a starter and if it's like a big sci-fi epic and if and if disney animation studio were to do it it would cost a lot more than that too is that is that because the production companies in japan work cheap um yeah i think to some extent but i mean i've i've made anime i wrote the original story for a series called urahara i wrote the story for a pilot that got made uh here in japan and, you know, it's a real tricky situation between where the money goes once someone contracts a studio. There might be a case where the producer takes all the money and just hands the scraps to the animators. Or there's a situation where the animators might party real hard on the budget and then wait, like, until the last minute to actually make the uh, the anime that they've been contracted to hire. So there's a lot of ways these things pan out. It's a miracle 
that uh, stuff gets made and, and some stuff is good, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Is any of this stuff uh, like done offshore in the Philippines or Taiwan? Or, oh, there's uh, tons uh, of South stuff. Korea? Yeah, I think that's been the case since I think, you know, it's like uh, probably beginning in the 70s and 80s, you know, there would be animation studios operating like in Korea and increasingly China. And Well, the famous xenophobes of Japan, I mean, weren't there some purists who objected to uh, outsourcing some of this stuff or sort of gone beyond that it's really just a commercial enterprise and you go where the money is it feels like yeah this idea of just anime is just a medium that there's a global audience and it needs to be fed right right no right. matter what i think is kind of where everyone's head is at now and um you know kids want to make it kids want to draw manga they want to make their own anime you know i've definitely had my head in that space before and um, I mean, the most insidious thing now is probably AI. You know, I, I see Japanese creators um, really worried about the future because anyone can just type make an anime, you know, girl holding a machine gun flying a giant robot and it will spit out something, you know, that's passable. And, you know, probably as the years go by, you know, increasingly better and better. So it's why hire a Japanese studio to make your Lord of the Rings anime? Why not just have the computer make it, you know? Well, right. I mean, and they should be worried because the, the quality is getting better at an accelerated pace. Yeah. And I think with visuals, it's just too easy, you know, to just crank out anime cat girl images or things that look like Gundam but aren't Gundam. You know, it's just endless. You know, you can anyone can create their own IP that looks like authentic Japanese anime at this point. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, argument because people complain about it, say, well, they're just scraping the internet and they're, you know, producing derivative images. But then aren't we all? Yeah. I mean, I think it's part of Japan's branding and, you know, uh, acceptance of anime and manga, not as high culture quite yet, but as pop culture. It's not junk culture anymore. You know, it's now it's kind of pop culture globally recognized as such. And it's branded as Japanese. I, I think there is some kind of pushback, increasingly less so, you know, when something is, looks like anime, but it's made by an American, or it's made in Korea, or it's made in China. There's less of that, but, you know, th that that was kind of Japan's, you know, kind of uh, trump card, not that trump card, but the trump card, which is like J Japanese made in Japan, authenticity. You know, Hayao Miyazaki's like this kind of like handcrafted yeah, you know, yeah. kind of shokunin kind of thing, right? So how does that whole process work? Does it do you go from junk culture to pop culture and then back to junk culture if you're not careful? <laughs> I, it seems that way, yeah. I mean, I think money talks, right? I think that's sort of like... Every year, there's always this annual report, like um, how the anime manga business, what it, what is the valuation, how much money did it bring in last year? And every year, it's like more and more. You know, during the pandemic, people spent a lot of money on their hobbies, and it grew. I think maybe things are cooling, normalizing a little bit now. But you know, the you know the amount of people interested in this content is just you know, it keeps growing. Whether they're spending is kind of... Yeah, you know. I mean, uh, according to most analysts of the American book publishing industry, manga and anime basically saved publishing's ass, you know, after the pandemic. <laughs> it's been like a huge, huge money maker, and it's just growing and growing and growing. Yeah, I mean, that's the only reason we can do Otaku USA for 17 years, because the audience supports it. If we were doing, I think, any other kind of mag, if we were doing like music or news or something, I don't think it would work. You can put your kind of snob hat on a, a little ah. bit if you'd like. Uh, do you think that that consolidation of the industry has been ruinous? Or if you're just saying, well, it's pop culture, it's really just about money anyway, who, who really cares? I, I, don't, I don't really see like a, a massive negative. There's less competition. Uh, there's less, I think some of the companies in Japan aren't as thrilled about it because the whole point was to have you know, different people bidding on their new titles. You know, like we, the Japanese television station, has X number of shows. There are X number of companies outside of Japan that will bid for them like crazy to get the streaming or video rights. And that's not really the case so much anymore, you know? How about in the manga world? Are there any, uh, what would you call, like, uh, pirate or rogue companies that are staunchly independent? And it's kind of like the way... Uh uh, you know, our crumb was back in the '60s. You know, these underground comics—they they, were—they were too crazy. You know, mainstream stores wouldn't wouldn't stock <laughs> them, but 
people would search them out because they they basically spoke their language. You know, they were they were like a lot deeper and a lot more interesting and politically uh, astute. Yeah, I mean, you can find that stuff. There's still a lot of shops, at least here in Tokyo, that you know service this kind of subcultural each side of self publishing. Obviously, there's like doujinshis that you can buy. You know, at the uh, the seasonal events like Comic Market, but there are stores that are open. You know, most of the year that service the kind of more you know edgier underground kind of the lunatic fringe of self publishing and manga in Japan. Yeah, it sort of leads into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is sort of Japan writ large, and and you don't have to. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please give it I a shot. I live here, so yeah, yeah. So you ought to be able to to tell me. I'm kind of curious. Is it more difficult to be a rebel in Japan now than it was 30 years ago? Are, are the Japanese inclined to be rebellious and independent, or do you do you feel like the the nation has sort of sagged into a certain kind of uh, complacency? I, I see more rebellion here than I did when I moved here six years ago. I mean, I think huh. the pandemic, COVID, was kind of like a seismic change. I think before that, the only one I'd really lived through was like the 311 tsunami uh, right. and the nuclear meltdown. And I was in America for that, but um, I really felt the reverberations, uh, this kind of skepticism against institutions, this kind of paranoia, justified or not. And then with COVID, that kind of feeling went global, right? Um and that's when you start to get things like conspiracy, misinformation, people just afraid and, and paranoid. And, you know, gradually you began to see things like wacky candidates running for the mayor of Tokyo, <laughs> where <laughs> like literally they have the signboards outside like the elementary school and there's like porn stars or like people who run host clubs with their posters up. Uh, joke candidates, you know, people just kind of using this system just as a wacky means of self-promotion, a kind of subtle erosion of institutions that we've seen globally, but happening in Japan in a way that I didn't really see this six years ago. It was a little more like, okay, well, politics is over here. The kind of music show by adult entertainment is over here. And um, maybe those people were out there, but now because of the internet, the, the the level of, of noise and the uh, the insanity <laughs> feels like the volume's been turned up a notch. And I guess as people are rebellious, you know, in a way, you could be a guy who dresses up like the Joker and runs for city council here and uh, live stream and say something provocative and outrageous. I don't know how much of this is an influence of what's happening in, a, you know, what people see in American politics and sort of doing, you know, re replicating that sort of like you know, uh, I'm a troll running, you know, for office. All right. Well, we, would you say that the Japanese are taking life a little less seriously? I mean, are they, are people still stepping up and sacrificing on behalf of the group, uh, working long hours? I don't know about the big picture stuff. I mean, I have my daily life. I have my interactions. There's such a bedrock of, uh, you know, elderly people who grew up, you know, during the Showa era and whatnot. So that, that, Morality feels like it's well, well. Well, we'll talk about that a bit. I mean, the the coming demographic crunch, right? When there's fewer and fewer younger people are going to be expected to pay for the uh, Social Security, the Kosei Ninkin payments for all the um, the old people who are no longer earning. The future looks. I don't say bleak, but there's there's a lot of challenges here. <laughs> Uh, for the future. So I don't know if people are going to make the right decision, if they're making the right decision. You know, I think history will decide, sadly. Yeah. Well, uh, do, you, do you see any of the, uh, the, the foreigners coming in and buying up the uh, empty houses? Uh, I don't see that. I mean, I'm in Tokyo, so I, I, I see that on Facebook. It's like this sort of dream, right? It's sort yeah, of like I've seen the them. emergence of what we can call this the Japanese dream, right? Like, I'm a foreigner, and it's my dream to live in Japan. I mean, I certainly had that. Matt Alt certainly had that. But now it's sort of like, we, we wanted to come here just so we could, you know, buy toys and uh, play video games and, you know, like, you know, see Godzilla movies before they were released in America. Well, I assume you still do all that stuff. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> but this people who are like escaping their their own living situations in in countries that seem to 
be more prosperous, right? I mean, sort of like I can, you can't buy a dream house in America for half a million dollars, right? I mean, do you still see that happening? I mean, Japan is like, Japan within Japan is just Japan. You know, it's just like, here's, here's a place, here's where you live. But outside Japan, and Japan is sort of guilty of this, it's like selling its self as a place where you know hello kitty walks the street kind of thing <laughs> cool japan cool japan yeah, right exactly I mean, they want to make it a, a tourist nation yeah. right they want to have like a hundred million tourists here by like you know this time next week probably yeah but that's literally the number that they're aiming for i guess i've kind of had two experiences in japan one was just like visiting three times a year and going really hard and shopping till I dropped and having as many experiences as I could then going back to America and trying to, you know, right, ride right, the right. high, you know, trying to ride it all down or, you know, keep the buzz alive somehow. And now, now I live here and there's like, you know, daily life and there's additional kind of pressures and tensions you get with that, but you get like a, another kind of insight. Like I'm no longer, you know, trying to be like a 24 hour party person and just trying to um, find crazy stuff to write about, you know, all the time so I can have something to do when I'm back in America. You get this kind of new, you unlock a new level of like daily life where you see what it looks like when a construction company builds uh, a school, right, right. like in your neighborhood, or you see like, um, you know, the, the the kids at the daycare center getting pushed around in a wagon. Um, and just seeing that, like the day to day, the day to day rhythm of everyday life, and I've gotten a chance to do things here, living here that I never would have done, like going participating in the what do they call that, the sports day festival at the elementary school. What is that, the Undokai? Yeah, yeah. Or doing the uh, mikoshi during right. the local matsuri stuff like did that. You I never would have done. I have carried a mikoshi before wow. yeah, in a matsuri. How drunk did they have to get you before you would agree to do it? <laughs> Pretty early in the morning, yeah. so I think, yeah. I, I, I drank after at around right. 11 o'clock. Um, so I don't really know how to incorporate that stuff into my work necessarily because my, my head is always kind of like in a, always thinking about Japanese movies, Japanese anime, Japanese music, Japanese fashion. But there is this kind of like new space that I'm I'm kind of dwelling in now. And then that's, this, it's a more mundane, but uh, it's kind of where... There's 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 a continuity of life there that you don't get from trying to rock and roll all night. You and Matt had this really interesting conversation in your recent podcast where you're talking about writing and your rituals and practices and habits and how you wrote and you you guys like approach it very very differently. But at one point you were talking about the Gaijin memoir. Person comes to Japan has a bunch of odd experiences. Maybe they live here for a year or two. They teach English or they work for a corporation. They go home, then they go back and they write this book about how wacky it is in some or respects. how awful it was. Or how Can awful you believe it that was. They, they wanted me to work overtime with no pay. Yeah. Or they talk about all the, you know, all the, all the people that they slept with and the amount of stuff they drunk and their run-ins, you know, and all, all that sort of stuff. And, and you guys, you know, I like to think that there's a, you know, there's a certain literary quality to to the the, the, the stuff that we've done. <laughs> I, it was either you or Matt that said that genre is dead. You know, you cannot write those kind of books anymore. I never read a lot of those. What was that? Wrong about Japan was one of those. I think that was the last one where it was revealed later the author had like made up this, uh, you know, Japanese friend that showed them the real Tokyo. That, yeah. I mean, yeah, every five minutes over here, it's like, oh, no, it's here come the Yakuza. Oh, no, here right, come right, the suicidal right, right. schoolgirls. Oh, no. It just, you know, there's so much fantasy surrounding Japan that I'm, I'm glad I, I get to live in the the day-to-day, -day, the daily life. The Everyone's, like, looking for the real Japan, but everyone's also looking for, like, the surreal Japan, and it's really hard. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, you I wonder... find your own Japan. You yeah, know, you, yeah, you your, sort of find your own Japan. And and what strikes me is that the the books that are most successful are not the ones where, you know, someone is like presenting the weird Japan and they're just bystanders, you know, observing and like showing you this weird stuff. But it's actually part of a personal narrative. Something happens, they change, they really respond as a person. And I think you guys were kind of dismissing that sort of book as well. You were kind of saying that the role of the Gaiji writer now should be an information provider to provide honest and complete information, <laughs> not to use secondary sources, but to only use primary sources. 
that's kind of what we do. I mean, that's what you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I was, we were both really, really inspired by Manga Manga, Fred Schott's book. That was kind of our Meet the Beatles. You know, that right. was kind uh-huh. of our, our big breakthrough moment. How to approach Japanese pop culture, how to find Japanese culture through its pop culture, whether that's junk culture or not. And it can go to the contemporary, it can go deep into history. Um, so that was really important. That, that, that really influenced us. And I'm kind of curious what the next generation will do. Where are the new Gaijin writers? I don't know if they even exist, because I think video has really kind of taken over this space you know, like TikTok and YouTube, most of the the most popular Gaijin content creators, that's the medium they use is not necessarily, when I read Manga Manga or when I read Fred Patton's articles in Starlog magazine about Japanimation, I wanted to write about it. I wanted to kind of tell people about it or study it, you know? Um, But I don't know if these, there's something about like, I'm going to turn the camera on myself. I I think it's a bit ironic because a lot of the things that, attracted people to Japan back in the day when I, when I was a young man and I was going there and even still now is this is this incredible accomplishment of the culture the the depth you can take almost any subject and you start jumping into the rabbit hole and you go down and down and down and down and there's just endless endless like vocabulary there are people who do it with with incredible talent and then there are all these places where it sort of bleeds out into other aesthetic forms whether it's ceramics or zen but that only comes with a lot of dedication i mean that old story about you know you have to apprentice for seven years before you're allowed to actually make a pot yourself you know if you're working the ceramics workshop I don't know how true that that was, but definitely people who wanted to apprentice and learn how to do something well, they put in their time, they put in the work. It was a, it was a form of dedication that would frighten almost anyone else. It frightens most <laughs> Japanese these days, right? And the idea that you're going to come in and you're going to present Japan to the world in 15-second chunks is really not it. And if that's all you're doing, you're never going to you're never actually going to learn anything. Yeah, there are some YouTubers who are doing great stuff. And, you know, I, it's it's one thing to write about a crazy place and a crazy location. And it's another thing to actually, you know, take you there through a well-produced video. So I'm not slamming the whole um, YouTube, vi- kind of the video gaijin Japan, because <laughs> there is some good stuff being made there. The best YouTubers, you do walk away having learned something, right? And I think some of these people are doing research. Some of these people are framing things in a way that's new. Maybe that's that's the next generation. As, after I moved here, I got more into the history of Japanese audio, Japanese audio companies like Yamaha. I mean, I have a kind of a crazy stereo that I never could have had in America. I just bought it through like used parts here in Japan. And um, you go to like the audio shows here and everyone is in their 70s. I'm usually the youngest <laughs> <Right>. guy in the <laughs> room. Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, obviously digital culture and the smartphone has completely transformed. But I mean, yeah, I think a lot of this stuff is just going to go the way of the dinosaur. A lot of this old tech, a lot of this old appreciation for the way people do things, it's really just going to um, come back to what can't be digitized. Is, is it is it still useful? Well, I mean, you're kind of talking to a dinosaur when you say that. So I, uh, I, I no, hear but I'm you. getting there. I'm getting there. You know, like I said, I'm in my early fifties, so I'm sort of, um, you know, the midlife crisis. I need to have. I need to have my ultimate stereo now. Oh, Now's the time, it's Patrick. Now, I, I time to do all the dad stuff. I, f- I feel your pain. You know, <laughs> when they hit seventy, then then talk to me. So, uh, tell me what you're working on uh, these days. Ooh, fiction, fiction. Really? Um, you're writing yeah, a novel. Yeah. Well, I've I've been baking two of them slowly in the background, but I think it's time to finally. There's a lot of really amazing stories that just can't be told uh, if you use people's real names or real <laughs> events. Right, right. You know, you, th- there's some amazing stuff that's happened that that you just have to add that code of fiction to just you know bring it to the world. So I want to do that specifically with. Harajuku, the Japanese fashion space. There's yeah. so many amazing personalities and stories, and you know, kind of a, I don't say a dark. There's a there's there's the light kawaii side, but there's also like a dark side there. 
So I really want to do like kind of an urban fantasy. I have it all mapped out. I just need the time. I just need to find a publisher who's willing to let me write for eight hours a day with no <laughs> with no problems. Um, so I can just focus on it. You're but, looking for a six yeah. figure advance. Well, I hope you find well, one. Well, I don't know six figure, but if I could just have six months to just <laughs> focus on it. So that's what I'm. I want to. I'm revving my engines up to to finally do that. So that's gonna that's gonna keep you busy along with your editing and your podcast and and everything else. I hope so. Yeah, I'm doing um, a lot of work on DVDs. Some some publishers in the UK and in America are releasing older Japanese films, and that's something I've always loved. Are these the uh, the commentaries you mean? Yeah, but they're more like video essays, not like full feature commentaries. Like, I'll just talk for 10 minutes about the film. Oh, I see. And okay. stuff like that. Not a full commentary. Contextualizing things. Kind Contextualizing of. it and uh, yeah. maybe introducing some of the cast or some background elements. And those are a lot of fun. So I'm working on those as well. And uh, I, I just have one more question. Sure. Two things that uh, you think maybe people should be reading, and they could be like online blogs or they it could be, you know, some some book. And you're not allowed to say Otaku USA because we uh, get it. I can't okay? say my own stuff. I think Matt Alt's Pure Invention, I would say this even if Matt wasn't my like best friend in Japan and my podcast co-host, but um, Matt He's Alt's, standing right next to you waving he is. He's behind Ichimai me with a, though, right? yeah. Yeah, He's behind yeah. me with a samurai sword. Right. Um, really charting the post-war pop culture history of Japan through its inventions, whether it's Pac-Man or the karaoke machine, Kata, okay, pardon me, those kinds of things. That's, that's a really fascinating book. And uh, I think it's important to like leverage anime and manga as like a gateway to these other things that happen in Japan, these other aspects, um, you know, history, cultural trends that are just outside of that space. It's a book that will, can get you hooked through your interest in gaming or, or your interest in anime or manga and then kind of open up the world to you, which is kind of what's similar to what Manga Manga did, which is sort of like, well, maybe you're interested in anime, but here's here's the student rebellion in the 1960s. Here's you know a bunch of other crazy things that happened that might interest you. Um, so that's the big one, I think. I really recommend that. And also, I think people should look back at uh, Fred Patton's book. What is that? Watching anime, 25 years. Watching anime, reading manga. Yeah, yeah. great book. Great. It's book. only available as an ebook now. Oh, really? That's too bad. I have yeah. a, a really well loved dog eared copy that I packed with me when I moved here. Um, people are always asking the question, like, how did this happen? How did this thing get so right. big? But this book is like a diary of exactly how it happened, exactly how anime and manga took over North America and eventually the world happening in real time. So it's really fascinating. It's it's aged beautifully, I think. And when I wow. wrote my and most recent books, Essential Anime and A Kid's Guide to Anime Manga, that book was always out. Well, I appreciate you keeping it in the family, uh, Patrick, because <laughs> uh, you got Matt Alt's book and he's your uh, <laughs> podcast partner. And then you got uh, watching anime, reading manga, which is a Stonebridge Press book, and so that's that's great. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Patrick. It's been great talking yeah, well, thanks, to you. Guys, let's and, do this uh, again sometime soon. Yeah, and I I want everyone to to check out uh, Pure Tokyo Scope. That I I listen to it on my walk, and it's really fun. Well, thanks so much. Find out more about Stonebridge Press and our books and authors. Go to www.stonebridge.com. You can find our Substack, The Stone Bridge at stonebridgepress.substack.com and you can visit and message us on Twitter at at Stonebridge Pub or on Facebook at Stonebridge Press. To reach us by regular email, write to us at spp at stonebridge.com.